Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you so much for being here to, for the District 11 community discussion with our Office of the Police Oversight Monitor, Von Seal Shokunbi. Did I say that right? That so, Independent Police Monitor Director. I first want to give a huge thanks to Luis Lozano from Clayton. He uh, really helped us set up uh, this room and, and have it ready for uh, us here today. Uh, and so thank you so much for offering the space. Um, and there are also cookies and water if y'all haven't partaken in those um, housekeeping, other additional housekeeping details. The restrooms are down the hall, women's to the left, men's to the right. So just welcome everybody again to the, our event today. Um, let me, um, we're going to do uh, the remark, well, welcome for a couple of minutes and then Bon Seal will tell us a little bit about what she does with in her office. And so this sounds a little weird. Should I just like, yeah. I think we need it. We'll turn it off. Cozy. All right. Okay. A little bit about what she does uh, in her department, um, you know, um, what she's done since she's been here, what the office, um, you know, handles, um, and also some things that have come up recently. We all know about the incident on 7th Street, uh, the excessive force. So we'll, we'll address that issue too. Just to understand the process better, you know, just we, we there's things that happen within the city of Fort Worth um, and we feel like they should be addressed immediately, but they have to go through a process. You know, there's a legal process and ultimately it's up to our police chief to uh, make that final decision. And so we'll also be discussing that. So, Boncio. All right. So thank you everyone for coming out. This is a fantastic turnout. I asked uh, Councilwoman Martinez yesterday, I was like, how many people do we think are coming? I mean, if three come, I'll be really excited. So um, this has exceeded my expectations. Some of you might've heard a similar presentation before. We have updated facts and stats and wanna focus on District 11. Because I am still a year in, I will do my full introduction in like in September. I'm gonna stop talking about where I came from, my background, everyone will know me by then, right? Um, and I am also going to introduce my staff very briefly. So my name is Bonsil Shokunbi. I am the director of the Office of Police Oversight Monitor. I joined the city of Fort Worth in September of last year, September 11th, oddly enough, of 20. 2023. Um, it was a national search. They put us through all of the ringer. So we were hired with, I was hired with community input, with police input, um, city council and everyone. And so I am thrilled to be here and it has been an amazing oppor opportunity and journey thus far. I'm joined by my entire staff today. I will say I did just hire someone like five minutes before getting here. Um, so I'm thrilled. But everyone that's on payroll as of today, if you can just stand and I will introduce you or have you, self have you introduce yourselves briefly. Um, so we are a small staff. I am slotted for eight positions. You don't see eight people before you here today because I'm still hiring, but we're getting there. So first of all, we can start with Mr. Sullivan. Hi, everybody. I'm Aaron Sullivan, our Deputy Police Monitor. It's a pleasure to serve. And Mr. Sullivan, when did you start with the Office of the Police Oversight Monitor? About 24 hours ago. Right. <laughs> So we're thrilled to have Eric joining. Um, we will go through his bio and all that thing is, all those things will be online. But what I like to say is interesting. So we get a lot of uh, slack for lack of a better term for I'm an attorney is my background um, and we can go through all of that, but I'm not a officer. So Eric is a former officer, but what is very interesting um, is that when he started and correct me, don't correct me now, correct me later. Um, when he started policing, he started around the time of Ferguson um, in St. Louis. So during the day, he was holding back the protest lines in Ferguson and at night, because he's involved in community and so uh, rights engagement, he was going out to give water and food to the protesters. So I think that's a beautiful dichotomy to come into this work. We're required to be neutral and it's a way to um, see policing in a different world. He has a litany of experience um, recently leaving UNT doing compliance work um, in a different field, but very similar. And so we're thrilled to have him on board. And then next we have my right hand. <laughs> uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Brandigan Contreras and I'm the office manager for Oklahoma. I've been with the office for two and a half years. She is our longest standing employee at this point, so, all right. Hi everyone, I am Lucy Tarrant and I am a policy analyst for the fall. And then on the camera right here, the person that you will hear from the most is... <laughs> no. <laughs> That's not that. Um, I'm Taylor Davis, I'm doing engagement and mediation, and I've been with the office for a year. 
So we're a small but mighty team. There are over 1,800, closer to 1,900 last time I checked, uh, Fort Worth Police Department officers. So we're spread thin doing as much work as we possibly can. But I'm thrilled to be here today to educate you all on what the office does. A little bit on my background because I have gotten the question. And so let's not have anyone have to ask it. What qualifies you? Oh, y'all can say, I'm sorry. Um, what qualifies you to do this? Um, I kind of fell into the work, but it's something I'm very passionate about. I'm going to give my whole spiel. Um, so I started off going to law school and that was horrible and miserable and I didn't like it, but I went and I finished it because that's what you're supposed to do. Finished law school and I went into criminal prosecution, which is something that I was very passionate about and believe in strongly, but I believe that everything that you do should be done well and you should do it right. And so I am strongly, um, convicted about accountability and meaning that on either side that you are on, you need to do what you're supposed to do. Uh, quickly therein, and some of you have heard this story, quickly therein, my very first case I tried involved police misconduct. It wasn't a use of force incident or something like that. There were officers that were involved in stealing money from a confidential informant, unrelated to my case, but I risked the, uh, having a conviction overturned because of that. Immediately I go, whoa, that's not fair to the community that we serve. I stayed in that job for a little under seven years, prosecuting drugs, rapes, murders, all of it. Um, and also had the opportunity to prosecute officers as well as individuals are responsible for killing officers. What I found is, is that there was not enough accountability within the police department. I'm speaking about my former city, which was New Orleans, and I was also burnt out. I had a wealth of knowledge and experience in dealing with those cases and had the opportunity to then enter into oversight. For those of you who don't, I speak fast, I apologize. If I'm speaking too fast, just go ahead and let me know. Um, for those of you who don't know, New Orleans is under a federal consent decree. So I had the opportunity to enter into oversight on a federal level and a local level and have that experience. I was really, really, really burned out. And so I had a degree in public relations and I was like, daddy, that was cool. I was a lawyer for a minute. Let me stop. I'm going to go and I'm going to do community engagement. And that's what I thought I was going to do. And my boss was like, wait, dead bodies. You can handle that because I'd handled so many murders and things of that nature. So I quickly took over use of force, transitioned into handling all of use of force, then transitioned to being second in command, being over all misconduct for the New Orleans Police Department compliance with the federal consent decree and use of force. And then I was recruited and now I'm here and I am thrilled to be here. And so that's my background. My stance on oversight, which I will go through in deep uh, in more detail, is my expectations for the Fort Worth Police Department to comply with their own policies and procedures so that they can be the best police department for themselves as well as the communities that they serve. So I'm excited. We'll have open forum questions and answers. We have note cards over here if you would like to submit your questions and remain anonymous. But I'm hoping that this is informative for everyone. And um, yes, so I neglected to mention we do have cards here at the OPOM table. So you, like Fonseil said, you can remain anonymous and you can hand those off to my district director, Rachel Arellano. We also have an intern that's been working in our office, Maya Perez. So if you just put those in the air, they will come by and pick those up and we'll start Q&A at 630. All right. We're ready for the presentation. All right. Welcome to the OPOM District 11 presentation. <laughs> I'm back again. All right. I apologize. I don't have a clicker, so work with me here. All right. So what we do, um, first, I want to focus on how we are set up, because one of the concerns you hear in police oversight quite often is you're just part of the system. You just work for the man. You answer to the police chief. You just do whatever the city council wants you to do or what the mayor wants you to do. And that's not true. And so I like to review factually how we are set up. I am paid and we are funded through the city of Fort Worth. Um, however, the structure of my office is different from a lot of other offices. You'll hear me say that we're office and we're not a department because I don't report out to city council. So of course we work in relationship with city council as I am here and we take meetings and we have a working relationship. However, I don't report in the same mechanism um, that other departments do. I am an office under the city manager's office. So if you look at for example, the police department, there is an assistant city manager that he reports to William Johnson, fantastic man. I don't report to an assistant city manager. I report directly to the city manager and that provides some protection from any other unintentional influences on our office, be it from shared uh, departments or things of that nature. Everything that I do goes through our current city manager. I'm weeping because he announced his retirement, um, David Cook, and that's how we are funded and who sets the initiative for our office. Um, and to be clear, we do not report to the Fort Worth Police Department. Um, we are not housed with the Fort Worth Police Department, anything of that nature. We are separate. 
we have a wonderful working relationship and that's important for us to be able to do our work. I meet with the chief um, regularly. I meet with the command staff regularly, but we are not housed together. We do not answer to each other, um, anything of that nature. So what do we do? The number one thing that we do that is most important, one of the things that people wanted to see historically is that we take um, police complaints. Does anyone know, if you've seen me speak before, I'm a call and response type of girl, I like to ask questions. I mean, some of you do know the answer. Um, how did you file police complaints prior to 2020? Anyone? What was the only way you could do it? Yes. I went downtown. All right, you would have to go downtown. What, what changed with the implementation of our office? You don't have to go downtown. You don't, you don't have to go downtown. You don't have to go to the police department. You don't have to go to the city manager's office to have it then referred to internal affairs. You can call our office directly. For a lot of citizens, that provides some comfort and um, some safety in knowing that someone else is monitoring that complaint and we're making sure that everything that you intend to be said is sent over to internal affairs. So there are things that maybe we notice that you don't notice when you're following the complaint. Maybe there's some things that we see when we're reviewing the complaints that you were not aware of, and we send those over to the police department. To be clear, we do not investigate police complaints. We do not have the authority to investigate. We're allowed to investigate to the extent of filing the police complaint to internal affairs. So I don't go out and say, hey, Mr. Officer, come in. I want to actually talk to you and let's let, let's have an interview. And I don't go into citizens. I don't go pull video camera footage. But one of the beautiful things is we have unfettered access to everything that the police department has. Every police, report, every police report, every body cam, anything of that nature, we're able to review. We generally review it in real time of re uh, receiving the police complaint to determine what we need to do with that. Secondly, we review all of the investigations from internal affairs. So we'll go over the numbers in a minute, but we get about this many police complaints. That's, that's what we get. The police department gets this many police complaints. So we review every single co police complaint and internal affairs investigation to ensure that they're complying with their own policies, to make sure that it's a quality investigation, to make sure that even if an officer is disciplined, that there's consistent discipline between officers. Um, our policy analysts who spoke earlier, that's their job. They take po police complaints. Everyone in the office can take police complaints, but they review every single complaint that comes to the office, whether it's rudeness, discourtesy, and currently all the way up to use of force. Um, we monitor all use of force incidents by the Fort Worth Police Department. If a use of force incident happens, um, depending on the severity, I receive a call immediately. But I'm notified of every single use of force that incident that occurs. I receive a um, links with access to all of the body camera footage. Everything happens within use of force. We attend and we provide recommendations to the use of force review board. There are some uses of force that get sent out to the chain of command for review where they go, hey, actually would like a group of specialists essentially to look at it in a little bit more detail. I sit on that board. As a monitor, I don't have a vote in that room, but I have a voice in the room. And that's a lot of what I do in general. I don't vote in a lot of these spaces, but I provide voice. I am a historic memory of, well, we did it this way before. I provide legal context um, and just different perspectives of how things can be interpreted. So we review all of those use of forces um, that happens monthly. I engage with community regularly. We're expanding our community outreach um, to make sure that we're hearing from the community that we are called to serve. We collect and analyze data related to complaints, uses of force, et cetera, um, in critical incidents. That is what is of utmost importance to me. This is really, really hard work. Um, and I don't say that because like I do it. I mean, it's hard work to move the needle on. It's hard work to inspire change. And the only way that you're actually gonna bring about that change is with the data to back it up. I don't like to make recommendations based off of one incident. I don't wanna see one thing and go, hey, PD, that was great. But what we need to do is we need to change this policy altogether. Let's look and see where the data leads us. Let's look at national best practices and actually drill down what are our problems and do we have any early warnings or are these things actually happening consistently? Um, I'll give an example from um, my prior city of what uh, drilling down in um, investigations looks like and one of the benefits in just one moment. We serve as the civilian oversight agency to ensure accountability and public trust in the police department. We do that by putting out the information that we can. Um, that is limited as when we talk about any other recent instances, I am limited on what I can say, but I wanna make sure that I'm providing the information when I can and making sure that we're educating the public, most importantly, on the processes and why it looks the way that it does. 
We provide periodic public reports on any of the findings, analysis, and recommendations that we have. I will show an update here um, in a moment. We just actually went live with, I think, four reports today, Taylor, um, that are up on our website. We provide a monthly report of all of the interactions we've had with the police department as well with internal affairs. And we review policies and procedures to make sure that they're uh, up to best standards. Reviewing policies and procedures is where we try to be proactive. Is there something that Fort Worth Police Department can actually do better? Not that they're doing it wrong, but can they be better in some way? And we always want to improve and get a little bit better. I'll give the story about what the work looks like um, and the impact that it can have when you're working in collaboration. And this is based off of a former city. So this relates to use of force, this relates to complaints, this relates to looking at data and digging a little bit deeper. Um, in March of 2017, I believe, um, March of 20, yeah, March of 2017, there was an incident in New Orleans and New Orleans has really, really horrible roads. There's potholes and things everywhere. So it's not a place that you should be speeding through. Um, and the officers went to roll call on that morning and they were told that there was a stolen vehicle. Vehicles get stolen constantly there. Uh, armed carjackings are a really big problem. There was a stolen bend. And so the officers went out or later that day, they saw the stolen bins with the same license plate. So they elected to conduct a stop on the vehicle. All right, all of this sounds valid. They ran the plate. It is in fact a stolen vehicle. Sounds fine. Now, New Orleans is different in this fact that you cannot pursue. Um, and so that is their policy. So they see the car, they hit the lights and sirens and the car decided it's not gonna stop. So they kept going. Well, those officers turned off their lights and sirens. When lights and sirens are activated, it activates all of the cameras on the vehicle, et cetera. They decide that they're gonna turn them off. It's three cars in a row. Then they decide to pursue the vehicle. It goes down a road. You have three cars stacked one behind another. The bins goes down, hits a pothole, goes across a major intersection, loses control, runs into about seven vehicles on the side, turns, flips to the side, runs into a beauty salon. Beauty salon catches on fire, kills all of the individuals in the car, being four minors and a young lady who was getting her hair done in the beauty salon. So that's horrible, right? Like no one's gonna argue that that's not horrible. We can go ahead and hold the officers accountable for it, but it doesn't stop there. And that's where oversight had to push a little bit further. That's when we had to urge, this seems a little bit odd for them to so comfortably just go ahead and turn the lights and sirens off. And the way that they wrote up the part, report was on a GOA gone on arrival, which is not an acronym that we use very often. So as we realized that they were doing gone on arrival, ran the data report to see how often they were doing that. Found about 17 other pursuits that illegally had been conducted. Then dug a little deeper and said, it's odd that these officers are doing it. Found out that the main band of them were in the same class and which sergeant was training them to do the same thing. So then discipline had to be rendered appropriately because we had some younger you know, officers in the back who were just kind of along for the ride and didn't know. And then we had our front officers who were actually spreading that information and causing the same harm. So it looked like significant suspensions all the way to termination, but it's digging down deeper than just your immediate incident. It's not, what was that in policy? You're done. It's digging deeper and making sure that you understand everything that's surrounding and how can we have a safer community as a whole. All right. What is misconduct? Misconduct is any violation of the Fort Worth Police Department general orders or the city of Fort Worth public rules and regulations. Sorry, I had a brain latch there. Most often it's use of force. What we see most often, I would say, is rudeness, um, things of that nature. Interference with constitutional rights, neglect of duty, discrimination, theft, um, retaliation, falsification of records. What I would like to say about misconduct is I don't need you to know the general orders. What I need you to know is that you have a safe place to come that regardless if you know it violated the general orders, there's somebody here that can figure that out. I, I operate on, if you have a gut feeling like that just didn't seem right, like, I don't know, I just don't like it. There's no harm. There's no harm in saying that. And I say that because it doesn't even reach the officers unless there's merit to the investigation. They're not even notified about an anything, like a complaint was even filed unless there's merit to warrant an investigation. And so come to our office, let's talk it through. It might be something as simple as, hey, I haven't been able to get my police report and I haven't heard from my detective and this is ridiculous. All right, cool. Well, what you don't know is that the detective's like out on leave, but I can help coordinate that and reach out to the sergeant and we can make sure that you go to the places to get the information that you're entitled to. We want to try to be able to bridge that gap, but please, please, please don't wait until, well, I'm not exactly sure. I don't, I don't want to inconvenience somebody because every officer wants to serve next to another officer that they know is doing the right thing. But the only way that we can know, there's only eight people on my staff, is if we have the interaction of the community. 
um, the complaint process. The way that the complaint or accommodation process, we do take accommodations so that if an officer is doing something great, which I've heard fantastic things, if they're doing something great, we want to know that as well. You can send that, you can call our office, you can send it via email, you can send a written letter. We received a couple of those, or you can come in person. That is, I will not lie, that is kind of difficult right now, but hopefully by the end of the year, coming in person won't be as difficult um, to see us. Once we receive that, these lovely young ladies over here will draft it up and it will be sent over to the Internal Affairs Department. And Internal Affairs will conduct a full and thorough investigation. We monitor those complaints along the way. Like, is it timely? Are they interviewing? Did they actually call you for any follow-up? Things of that nature. And we're, we have more capacity to give individualized attention to the complaints that come through our office versus the hundreds and hundreds that come through Internal Affairs. We can't actually maintain that level of support and give you updates when necessary on where the complaint stands. Um, we can monitor that investigation. The investigation, per their policy, can take up to 90 days. Um, by law, it can take up to 180 days. And so once we get to talking about current cases, I'll talk a little bit more about what that actually looks like and what implications that has. Once the um, internal affairs is concluded the investigation, they send that back to us. The goal is to get it back in 90 days because that allows for whoever needs to give comment or feedback to actually give it in a timely manner. Because imagine what happens if I get it on day 179. Anybody, guess what happens on day 179? What feedback can I give? None. Very little. A very t little impact that I can actually have. We're still gonna write it up and we're still gonna provide our recommendations because it might be an overarching issue. And also, I wanna document that I reviewed it and I'm, these are the things that we're seeing. So if there's a pattern with the officer, we can highlight it then. So that is why um, we're pushing for the earlier timeline. And that's also the goal of the police department to have it earlier so that they can do their reviews as appropriate as well. And then we notify any of our complainants once we're done with our review of the investigation. Because of the way the laws are written, we cannot provide, unfortunately, any of the written documentation that we write as it currently stands. We are working on being able to provide some more uh, context for the community members of what we observed in our review, things of that nature. But the way that chapter 143 is written currently, there's very little that we can communicate out about that individual thing, uh, individual review. That doesn't mean that we're not gonna talk to you and give you an understanding, but you won't be able to get a copy of our written reports, et cetera. All right. The numbers. So these are the numbers and as it relates to OPOM. Um, and these are the complaints that have been filed with OPOM. We are short one staff members. So unfortunately, I no longer have a data analyst, but I hired one, remember at five o'clock. So it's gonna get better. Um, as of today, as of May 31st, we had 29 complaints filed with OPOM. I can tell you we've, we have exceeded that number and based off of June and July that we had, I would anticipate that we've exceeded our previous years. Last year, we were around 43 at the end of the year. So I know that we've exceeded that number. That is substantially smaller than the number of complaints that are received by the police department. Um, internal affairs, I believe last year received 538 internal affairs complaints um, in comparison to our 40, but our workload still includes the 538 cases that we need to review. Um, for accommodations this year, we have received five accommodations, which is the highest number of accommodations that we've received to date. When we are talking about the districts, this breakdown is based off of what's been submitted to OPOM. Um, District 11, pat yourselves on the back for any um, uh, divisions are located in District 11. We have received no police complaints that can be assigned directly to District 11. Now we have police complaints for East and Central, but District 11 <laughs> specifically, um, we don't have that. The number one complaint that we see is failure to investigate thoroughly. Um, that is, uh, happens quite often on auto accidents where, well, they didn't look at X, Y, and Z and the laws have changed about what has to be looked at, things of that nature. But sometimes it is like, we need to assist in making sure that information's been exchanged, things of that nature. Um, OPOM provides recommendations. Now, our recommendations generally look like, hey, internal affairs, we identified another allegation should have been raised or something of that nature, or this is a training recommendation because this is a pattern that we're seeing and we want to provide this recommendation to you. The number one thing that we provide recommendations for is use of force, then it's complaints, then it's policy review, and then others. Those are just uh, a couple of one-offs. All right. Community outreach, 
This is what we do. If there is a place that you want us to be, we will be there. It is a small team, but they are all committed to the work of OPOM. And if we can possibly be there, we want to be there to make sure that we're informing people of the work that we do. We are in a back corner in City Hall that you cannot find. I do not expect people to know that we're here. When I started um, last September, one of the things I kept hearing was, oh, I forgot about your office, or I didn't know your office existed. And that's fair, um, but I wanna make sure that a year from now, we're not still having that conversation that I'm making sure we're going to the community that we're called to serve to make sure that they know that we're available. All right, community police mediation program. This is my baby of if 2020, what year is it, four? Um, and I can only co-own that with Miss Taylor Jade, near last name's not Jade, but I call her Taylor Jade. I know her last name's Davis, but Taylor helped launch this community police mediation program and it's absolutely fantastic. Community police mediation is an opportunity for police officers and community members to come and sit down at the table and have an open dialogue about the interaction that occurred. The way that this process works is someone files a complaint to internal affairs or they file it with the OPOM, it doesn't matter. Internal Affairs is going to review that for suitability for uh, mediation. So for the officers, if you haven't heard me say it, it has to be a case that we are going to have investigated regardless. So it's not a case where there was no merit to it to begin with. It has to be a case that would have been investigated. In lieu of investigation, a community member and police officer can voluntarily decide that they want to go forward to mediation. It has to be lower ranking things like discourtesy, rudeness. It can't be use of force or like sexual misconduct. It's only your low level offenses that we're looking at like letters of reprimand or one or two days of discipline. Um, it is about a two hour long process where we have community trained mediators. Hey mediators, y'all want to wave? They came out to support. Um, that went through a 50 hour training. Yeah, a 50 hour training. Very, very, very intense training to be prepared to deal with anything that is happening in that mediation room. It is, um, a safe place. It is the idea behind it is for the mediators to hold space so that all of the feelings can be heard and expressed on both sides. Yes, people should remain um, respectful as much as possible, but that is not the barometer. The barometer is, are we actually moving the needle towards community trust and progress? And so they are allowed to have this open discussion and then the individuals come to a determination amongst themselves of what their agreements are. The agreement can be, I just don't want to see you again. The agreement can be a variety of things of, um, I'll give this example from my prior city. We had one and long story short, the agreement was for the detective to follow up weekly because the detective had not been previously contacting the woman who was a victim of domestic violence, followed up weekly with her and it ended up leading to successful prosecution, which is extremely rare in those type cases. So it could be a myriad of things. It could be, you come out and see how me and my family live. It could be, hey, I appreciate this conversation. Let's have a nice day. Um, whatever the agreement happens to be. That process uh, started in April. We we're very thrilled. If you file a police complaint, um, and you think that it qualifies for that, please let us know, but you would hear from Taylor calling to see if that is something that you're interested in doing. All right. We need more bilingual mediators. We do. We have one bilingual mediator um, right now, and we try to match up our mediators to reflect the complaints that we have been receiving. So our number one complainant is a white male. We actually only have one white male mediator. Um, we have three black males. Um, and we tried, like, we had a plethora of black women, and so we had to cut down on black women to put in other diversity in the room um, and make sure that people in whatever diverse ways that they show up could be reflected at the table because science has revealed to us time and time again, when you see yourself at the table, you tend to be more comfortable and the needle moves further. So we like to encourage that as much as possible. This is all the information um, of how you can reach OPOM. Follow us on Instagram. What is it called? X? I'm sorry, I was going to say Twitter, Facebook, um, and threads. All of our data and things are provided, and it's not considered final until we issue it into our annual report just because things change. Um, do you want me to explain the critical police incident process? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to go over the critical police incident process very quickly. I cannot speak in detail about any incident unless it's a closed incident, but I think that this will be helpful. A critical police incident occurs and those who need to be notified are notified, which generally includes myself and internal affairs along with major case um, and other individuals report to the scene of that critical incident. 
The process from there starts with the investigation. The original investigation is conducted by Major Case. Major Case, someone want to explain Major Case? It's the black. They, they didn't solely do uh, nature deals like this, but they'll, they'll be these ones. I mean, kidnappings, a couple of these, but very, like, we didn't send a name. Yeah, it's a specialized skill set, and this is what they focus on. Or we take those. Right. And so that investigation is the criminal investigation of whatever the behavior is. That doesn't mean the police department believes that it's criminal or that it, it even is criminal, but it has to go through criminal review first before it starts into the administrative review. So you have major case who starts initially, and then you have internal affairs on this side. Now, what I spoke about earlier is something that's really important, and that's Chapter 143. That is the governing law for Texas for all firefighters and police officers. There is a meet and confer contract, which goes into a little bit more detail about exactly how it is impacted in Fort Worth. But that guides how long these investigations can take, what can be said about these investigations, who can discipline who, and when discipline can be rendered. So major case starts an investigation. At the conclusion of their investigation, it is generally referred over to the district attorney's office, which I have no involvement in whatsoever to determine whether or not there will be an indictment from the grand jury. Normally, if there's word back, then internal affairs will start their investigation. Sometimes, and I have to keep giving these caveats because it's not a blanket rule every time, sometimes the internal affairs investigation is going to wait until there's word from the um, criminal, from the district attorney's office, but oftentimes it will start before the district attorney has been able to say their conclusion, but the outcome of the internal, investi internal affairs investigation will be dependent on the criminal investigation, if that makes sense. So major case does their entire investigation, and then that can be turned over into internal affairs. Once it goes to internal affairs, and internal affairs does an administrative investigation. The administrative investigation is looking at the policies that the officers are expected to comply with from the police department. Not the laws, not criminal laws, they're looking at their own policies. There is a different burden that you have to meet. It is not beyond a reasonable doubt as it is in criminal cases. And they're looking for every officer involved and anything that can be involved in that allegation. So not just the use of force, but was your body camera on, things of that nature. And again, every single officer that's involved. That case has to be investigated by internal affairs and discipline has to be rendered unless they get an extension with 180 days from the date of incident. 180 days from the date of incident. I'm gonna put a pin really quickly. When I talked about filing police complaints, if anything ever happened, I wanna hear about it, right? But the more urgent you can be in reporting it, it's really, really important because there's only 180 days, not from the date of discovery, not from the date of disclosure as it is in other matters, but from the date of the incident. And then it is up for the chief of police and only the chief of police to render the decision based on what he believes discipline is going to be. There can be a use of force review board um, that is involved in that process, and it can also go out for chain of command. My office monitors that entire investigation. I said that I get notified from the beginning. I have the opportunity to sit in like the first review for major case, and then I'm involved in the process along the way. I get immediate access um, for everything that is involved in the case. So if there's real time crime center footage, um, any interview things of that nature, as major case does it, I have the ability to review it so that I can say, hey, I have a concern here. Again, I'm a monitor. I, my job is to wave and say, I see an issue. I cannot control and will not in interfere with an investigation, which is why I also don't speak on an open investigation. At the conclusion of the investigation um, is when the police chief can render discipline. There can't, again, there can be an extension from the attorney general if there's a reason to, but that has to be put forth by the police department. That's when everything. So a time frame, so at least six months. At you're looking at, in general, at least six months. It could go faster, right? Um, they, an investigation could be concluded faster, but in general, you're looking at at least six months, and we know from previous incidents it can extend past that point. I will say there are a lot of things that influence the uh, how expedited the process is because you don't want to make a mistake along the way because what you don't want to see no one in this room wants to see as an officer that shouldn't have a job turn around and get their job back because of technicality. Um, and so it's important when we're dealing with high level cases to dot every I and cross every T and not just jump the gun and do things out of sequence or not consistent with the way that they have been handled in the past. Okay.
So we're going to take questions, but first we're going to take those from the comment card. So if you have a question on a comment card, card um, we'll, we'll address those first, yeah. and then we'll take questions from the floor. But if I understand correctly, we don't have to go to both internal affairs and your office no. to start a complaint. Right? You can just come to my office. You can just go on our website. You can actually go on the My Fort Worth app. Um, after the last incident, we were listed at the top of the app. They might have demoted us. Um, everyone was tired of getting those phone calls. Um, but we are on the Mike Forworth app as well if you'd like to file a complaint and accommodation. But if you contact us, you know that your complaint is getting sent over and your complaint is being monitored by our office. If you submit your complaint to Internal Affairs and they're like, oh yeah, I met that lovely lady a couple of months ago, you can call us and let us know that you filed the complaint and we can make sure that we're monitoring it as well. Um, if you've already filed with Internal Affairs and you try to file with us, we're not going to resubmit it. We will we'll tell them that you've contacted us and we believe it's duplicate um, unless there's additional information that needs to be investigated. But just come to us and then we'll send it to Internal Affairs. And while I'm proud that we have no uh, cases, uh, there have been people that have called our office and we have referred them to OPOM. They just haven't followed through. So just there's stuff that does happen. Um, but it really is up to the individual and we encourage them and we also reach out to OPOM like hey heads up This person might call you so they have at least the contact information already, but yeah If something happens, please communicate it out There's no harm in just giving us a call and you can also file complaints on behalf of someone else um, To a certain extent um, there are limitations within that So if you know of something or you saw something, please let us know I've had people send videos to our Instagram DMs. However you want to communicate it, please. It's very, very important to com uh, communicate what's happening in community. We can only see but so much. So mom, grandma, brother, sister can report an yes. incident on behalf of their family yes. member? Okay. Okay. So this first question comes from the historic Hanley uh, uh, district, Henry district, uh, has an MPO who is out on medical leave. Please let us know when he will return. A substitute is, oh, well, this is a comment. I did check in on that and I was told that the position is now open and they're looking for NPO to replace that individual. So that is in process. Yeah. Um, how many complaints, uh, complainants find the complaint process to be effective and fair? Uh, is the police department cooperative with OPOM? I'll answer the second one first because that one's easier. Yes, the police department is cooperative with OPOM. I will be honest, I haven't had the opportunity to, to meet every officer, and I'm sure there will be some who are not thrilled to see me. But overall, we have had a positive working relationship, and we have a positive relationship with internal affairs, which is who we work with most often, as well as the command staff. Um, so we have been welcomed with open-ish arms, and I'm very thankful for that relationship. As far as satisfaction with the police complaint, um, I think that there is a certain level of disappointment that happens just by the very nature of understanding um, we have to substantiate feelings with evidence, right? Um, and there is a threshold and a burden that has to be met. What I do want to say is even if you're disappointed in the outcome of your investigation, that doesn't mean it's not relevant information for the future. It doesn't mean that, okay, this officer has had about four discourtesies. Maybe we need to look at something else. Some of the lower level cases are actually the hardest to prove because it's perception. And so we have people that are frustrated, but for the staff, we try to do a really good job of explaining the process, the burden that we have to meet and why it's still important to communicate those things. So I don't think everyone skips out of our office thrilled. Um, and even people that have allegations that are sustained um, aren't necessarily thrilled because of the ranges of discipline. I'm going to do another plug for mediation really quickly in answering this question. What, have I what I have found most often is people want to be heard. And what I've found most often is that they want to speak to the officer and tell them how they felt in the moment. And that's why we push mediation so hard, because it's one thing for someone to tell you six months ago you were rude to someone when you were doing a traffic stop out there having a hard day and then you get a letter of reprimand what is the impact and you as the individual had never had the opportunity to tell the officer how you how you felt but imagine being able to sit in the room directly with the officer and go look i get you're having a rough day i get that you had child care drop off and everything else but i want to tell you how i was feeling in that moment and maybe we can move in the middle i'll just the stats on that over 65 percent of the time the community member says that they have a better um 
65 percent of the time they have a better perception of the police department they'd had before entering that room and over 85 percent of the time police officers say that they would change their behavior um, based off of the mediation so that's why we like to push it because i can't always i can't ensure happiness ever but i know more often than not um, people are more satisfied when they've had an opportunity to use their own voice um, and I see that you have the address to old City Hall. Will you be moving to new City Hall and when? <laughs> That's a lovely question. Um, so we are not going to new City Hall. Um, we are currently in old City Hall. And I know there's some fat, sad faces. And I'm not going to publicly say where we're going just because let me get the ink dry on all of that. But I made the decision last year that we were not going to go into new City Hall because a lot of people are afraid of new City Hall. It is welcoming. It is a beautiful building, but I understand that everyone is not comfortable walking into that glass building. There's also a decent amount of needed security. Um, and I even had a mediator who came to Old City Hall that goes, well, that was a little threatening. The officers were trying to be helpful, the marshals, but they escorted them like two marshals escorted them to the office. All of those little bitty things um, create a uh, burdened and uh, blockades for people to file police complaints. So it was important to me to make sure that we created some separation, went out into the community. Hopefully we'll be at um, a very great location um, that is easily accessible to the community in the future, but we're not going to New City Hall. And I don't have a date because literally we had that final meeting yesterday. So, okay. <laughs> um, is there volunteer opportunities for members of the community? So currently, what we have been considering is how we can involve additional community members. And honestly, it's in outreach um, is the thing. Everyone in my office has sieges, clearance. Everything we do is super secretive and you need a badge to get behind doors, et cetera. And so the opportunity that people would have to serve now that, that wouldn't require that would be assisting us in tabling and going out and meeting and greeting um, the community. Our community mediators have been fantastic in doing that. We worked Mayfest, which was how many days? Five days? I don't know. It was horrible. Um, <laughs> we did. We did every single day, every single shift. I got caught in the rain. It was great. But the mediators assisted with that. So those are opportunities that we do when it's done to the community. Um, it will require some training and understanding of like the work that we do and that we're not advocates, that we're neutral parties and everything. But that is something that we're going to make available in the future. So uh, we have plenty of time to take some questions from the floor. Um, so if you have a question, raise your hand, but you'll have to speak loudly, please. How are we seven foot? I'm ready. <laughs> Is there a dynamic that shows you that the that outreach to your office is pretty much focused on a, a certain socioeconomic group? No. Um, it's actually surprising. I think a lot of, so if you don't know our, um, and I'll do this as far as any diversity um, for complainants, um, our ordinance is written for us to reach majority minority populations. Our number one complainant is a white male from North Fort Worth. Um, so that shocks people oftentimes when they hear that, but that's what we see most often. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Uh, could you clarify that you said you haven't received any complaints from District 11? So for 2000... Oh, yes. Have we received any police complaints for District 11? She wants me to provide clarification around that. For this year, so starting January of 2024 to May 31st of 2024, we have not received any police complaints. And by we, OPOM, not the police department, for District 11 specifically. That does not mean, and so if the incident occurred in either East or Central and it was outside, but you reside in District 11, that's different. It's based off of where the incident actually occurred. Secondly, uh, I, I, I filed a complaint with your office. Yes, ma'am. As well as I uh, followed up. Uh, as well as I, I have uh, reached out to Councilwoman Jeanette Martinez's office as well. I have not received anything. Let's check in on that to see if there is an update, but we will definitely, well, let's see. We'll talk. And we have our computers here, so we can check in on everything and make sure everything. Yep. So everything has been submitted. So there needs to be an open records request. So it, uh, we'll we'll make sure that uh, we help you with that process if it hasn't already been done, and follow up with um, that department. Now. 
So, and I will say we are not in the open records process unless it comes down to like something that is within our custody and control. Anything that relates to the police department that is in their custody and control. It's on two phone. No, I'll be happy. Well, let's chat afterwards about your specific incident and make sure that everything has been addressed. Listen to them. Please make sure. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Are there particular days when y'all open um, recruitment opportunities for the community mediator? And I say that that's what Martinez said. There's a need for bilingual mediator. Unfortunately, the mediation training is very, very expensive. Um, and so it will be a little while before I open that again. Um, we had to bring in someone specialized in that branch of mediation and house her for several days for, what was it, two weekends? Um, so we will not be opening that in the near future as we are um, mindful of our fiduciary responsibilities. There we go. <laughs> so there are um, mediators that have taken um, the mediation courses through the county Yes. Those wouldn't qualify for this particular? Okay. Right. So it has to be specialized? Yes. Data. Okay. Yes. Though we do think that is fantastic training, we just wanted to specialize on that po particular police and community member dynamic. Any other questions yeah. or comments? <laughs> yeah. I do this all night. Um, let me preface. I'm an advocate for our police department. Um, our institution. <laughs> They're amazing. Okay, that's that's what I've said. It struck me when you made the comment. The last thing you want to do, you not you mm -hmm. personally, but you generally, is um, put in a, a police officer back on the force that shouldn't be on the force. But the flip side to that is, you don't want to have a police officer lose their job. Correct. When they shouldn't have. So let, I want to be clear. When I say that we're neutral, we are watching to make sure that every officer and every investigation is done fairly. I am not prosecuting or after the police. I want to make sure they're complying with their own rules and policy. If Officer A he has a DWI and Officer B has a DWI, outside of mitigating or aggravating factors, I expect for them to have the same treatment. If you don't have the evidence to substantiate it, and my policy analyst will tell you, then we'll call it out. There can be sustained allegations, and I'm, we don't see it. We don't see the evidence there. We want to make sure that all of the officers are treated fairly, but they're accountable to their own rules and regulations. Absolutely. And one other thing that I didn't mention that we do is we sit on every oral board. So every time an officer is hired, whether it's lateral or if they're just off the street going into academy, um, myself or someone from the staff sits in on those and monitors those as well. So if there's a candidate that we're like, hey, there's some concerns, we wave the flag. Again, I don't have a vote, but if there's a candidate that it seems like someone's being overly harsh on, it's okay, well, did they meet minimum standards? Can we ask a follow-up question for these things? So I wanna be very clear, we're not gunning for the police department um, in any way. We wanna make sure that there is accountability and there are quality investigations that are going on. And to that fold, I, I wanna make sure that we're not wasting time and resources um, of the police department. So yes, ma'am. Great presentation, thank you. Thank you. I'm just curious, really two questions. Uh, is there a type of report to your office that you know is out there that you just wish you would hear more of? That it, it could be positive things, it could be issues that you know are happening, but until you have an inventory of people communicating that, you know it won't get addressed. But from your other city experience or elsewhere, is there something you wish you heard more of? I wish I just heard more in general. If there were one thing that's kind of been hard, um, is that you'll hear rumblings that things aren't good, but we're not hearing from people in general. Um, it's still quite a low number of police complaints, even that's filed with internal affairs. One major issue, this, y'all gonna be like, Bonso, where'd you come from? I have heard grumblings of um, trafficking, quite frankly, and I, I have heard some information and I would like to make sure that when people hear these small things that they don't discount them because it's not small um, and that they're communicating those things with us. If you have an officer who has always done the thing, we don't have to continue to protect the officer. There are ways to provide anonymity to people um, and handle 
those situations. So those are the two recent things is I want to hear from people in general. And I quite frankly, I've heard of uh, human trafficking of young girls. And so um, please, unfortunately, I have nothing to back that up. So let me be clear, because I know that that I am being videotaped. I cannot substantiate that. Um, but it is a concern because I've heard community rumors of it. Um, and so if those things are happening, I would want people to feel comfortable enough to come forward and let's discuss it um, and not put that in the laps of victims. Again, I have nothing to substantiate that that is happening in Fort Worth Police Department. I don't want that to be, um, I, I wanna stress that. Uh, I have a question. So, um, you know, Dallas, city of Dallas also has an yes. OPOM office. How do we compare in our numbers with them? We're quite different from them. Our setups are very different. So the thing about oversight is there's tons of offices everywhere. Um, Dallas, I want to say that they have fewer cases that they're dealing with on an individual basis. They have quasi-investigatory um, opportunities, but we're set up so different. It's kind of like comparing apples and oranges um, when you talk about Dallas and Fort Worth. We do communicate with Dallas. What month? A couple months ago, they came over and we had some discussions. I don't believe they've hired their new director and we communicate with Houston and Austin as well, just because statewide things always bring concerns for local offices. Do other offices have mediators like us? Dallas started a mediation program, but it's my understanding that they have never had a successful mediation. Um, but I believe that there are some reasons why that didn't happen, not for community members or police officers wanting to mediate, but there's some other stipulations required um, by them in order to participate in mediation that would be prohibitive. Yes, sir. What's the definition of a successful mediation? Successful mediation is that both sides have had the ability to be heard. Um, and so if you've showed up in earnest and um, participated in the mediation, that is considered success. So we don't have to agree at the end of the day because that's not the goal with mediation is to make sure that everyone has been heard. Yes, ma'am. Compared to internal investigation complaints and your complaints, the numbers are great. Like they get a whole bunch of people. Do you know why? Do you feel like there's something lacking in the promotion of this office that people don't know that it exists or they don't trust? I I don't think it's, oh, so the question is why, in general, there is a stark comparison between the number of complaints I received by OPOM and the internal affairs. Do I think there is a reason of why that exists? Is it lack of trust or lack of knowledge? I think that it's lack of knowledge and that the office is so new. This office started February 2020. We all know what happened after that. We went into the pandemic. The prior director was in place until November of 2022, and then she left. That gap stayed from November of 2022 until September of 2023. There was an interim trying to hold it down, but she's an assistant city manager. So I just think we need time. Um, and to remind the community that this office exists. And we had a very engaged community in 2022, but we lost a lot of that momentum and we're trying to gain it back. And also policing was a hot topic then and reminding people though we're fatigued and though we're tired, progress takes time and let's come back to the table. I think you will always have more people going to the police department because it's 18, like we know the police. A lot of my parents can barely describe to you what I do for a living. So you're, they're always going to have more. But I think as we spend more time, we'll be a more trusted and valued resource. But I do want to stress we're still looking at all of them regardless of where they come from. So you do have different outreach. I know that I know about you guys because I was a student. And from my undergrad, I did community health. And I researched a lot. And that's how I found out about you. But I did hear about you back before the pandemic, there was a little bit of promotion about it that was televised. And I just don't see anything lately about it. So I think people don't really know about it. We did so prior to, sorry, prior to my arrival, I think it was pretty much silent. Um, Taylor was hired in March of 2023 but wasn't doing outreach during that time period. When I started in September, she started with outreach. We did 
quite a bit of media coverage about the office and then did a whole nother burst of media coverage um, in the spring. We did start our social media. We didn't have a social media presence before then, Instagram, and we're trying to get as many places as we can um, and make sure that we're spreading the word. Um, for our future events, I'm sorry, I should have thought about that and put it on there. For future events, we are doing coffees with the OPOM monthly. We'll be at Hustle Blends on August 23rd and Cafe Zul on September 20th, I believe. We are also doing community office hours, um, which is where I'm having a staff member rotate to go out into the community, whether it's a community center or a library to be present with a table and the capacity to take complaints so people are reminded of who we are. We're trying to get in as many spaces as we can and remind people that the office does exist. But I do recognize that a lot of people have either forgotten or just not aware of our office. I was going to ask you that as far as visibility and just establishing relationships. Is there an opportunity for representatives from your office in, in a Fort Worth PD um, to kind of like talk to students or Absolutely. Because I remember when I was in school, I loved when the firefighters and police came for career day, you know, and it just kind of opens up that door. So even having someone from your office as well as them to like talk students through. Yes. So the question is, whether or not there'll be opportunities for our office or Fort Worth Police Department to come to schools or different organizations to talk about the work we do or building relationships in that way. Absolutely. I'm very passionate about connecting with our youth. If you look at the age that you get arrested, talking to you when you're 25 is a little bit too late. Let's talk to you a little bit younger about who's having those police interactions. Um, we are working on establishing our Know Your Rights program um, to be taught separately and in conjunction with the police department, teaming up with other organizations that are doing that work and trying to um, bolster the work that they're doing because there are no names that are doing good work that we want to support because we don't need to keep recreating the wheel um, over and over again. But yes, we are happy to be present where we're asked to be and tailor the conversation to whoever needs to hear it. So y'all heard Bonsi, if there's an event or a career day you want her to be at or my office to be I at, be we will be there. Yeah. Outside of having another pending obligation, I can't move around like city council. I will be there. <laughs> um, I think it would be a great idea if, and I don't know if your uh, the OPOMS information is already on that uh, form where people uh, go on the police department's website uh, to submit a complaint. If your information was on there as well, we are. I have a meeting tomorrow at two thirty about. Uh, it sounds like I'm making this stuff up, but literally. Oh. <laughs> Is it Wednesday? Yeah, Wednesday. Tomorrow at 2.30, we have a conversation about public portals and shared information and how to encourage that. So um, we are definitely working that and encouraging whichever avenue it comes through. We just want to make sure it's heard and received. It should go both ways. Yeah. yeah. I have one more question, y'all, and then I'll be done. <laughs> During mediation, do you find that most cops are willing to participate because they do have a choice, right? Mm -hmm. So do a lot of them say no or Majority of the time, officers say yes to participating in mediation. Um, they say yes more often than a community member, and they're generally willing at the table to talk. Now, do we come in a little bit reserved, and why do I have to be here? And you're reminded you don't have to be here. But as the conversation happens and officers realize it's not an attack, it really is a conversation, um, they generally open up and have a great conversation. I've told this story before, and I'll tell it really quickly. My last mediation that I did in New Orleans, I don't have the personality to be a mediator. It's not for me. Like, I get it. Respect to y'all. If you know me, you know it's not for me. But so I was opening the doors for the mediators and um, for the officers and individuals to come in. I knew the officer from my time in New Orleans, and I was kind of familiar with the, family, the community member. Hostile. When I tell you hostile, I can't explain to you how hostile and keep my job. The words that were said by the individual that came in, the community member was livid. I don't want to be here. This is stupid, sir. You don't have to be here. I just want to remind you it's completely voluntary. So we go through the things. He tells me to go get him some coffee. I do it with a smile a little bit begrudgingly, but it happens. <laughs> Officer comes in and he's like, Ponce, this is stupid. Again, you don't have to be here. You can just go through PIB and do their internal affairs. And it's stupid. He doesn't want to listen. I've talked to this man over and over again. I just need to tell him, all right, cool. But are y'all doing the mediation or not? Yes, we're going to do the mediation. They go to the back of the um, suite and they have their mediation. I kid you not, both men cried in the room. That's not my goal, 
Both men cried in the room because they were communicating past each other. The officer realized there were simple things that he needed that it wasn't necessarily part of his job, pulled out a post-it, gave him all the information that the individual needed. The, the individual was then able to understand, oh, this is why the officer was saying these things are operating in this way. Like, he could not give me this information. I was doing X, Y, and Z. It's not a court case. We don't pull out BWC and go like, you see, you ran the traffic stop sign here. Like, it's not that, but more often than not, people open up and are willing to participate in those conversations. I have participated or overseen one mediation that did not end well. One. In all the time that I've been familiar with mediation, and that's taking credit for like people who did it before me, I've seen one that did not go well and the people just left. But that was involving a high shot defense attorney mother or rape case and all types of things. But normally on everyday cases, um, you really see progress and change happening. So we have about 10 more minutes of questions. If anybody else has any further questions or we can close, do closing remarks. Yes, ma'am. Do we have any specific strategies or tactics in order to reach other demographics or diversity considering my number one complainant is a white male from North Fort Worth and that is not reflective of the community as a whole? Um, we team up with organizations. So there is a, um, LGBTQ police and fire chief luncheon thing that happens with evolving all of, or at least a lot of the LGBT organizations are in Fort Worth. I've had the opportunity to attend all but one of them, um, of the events and also had the opportunity to speak. The reason I wanted to speak is because I wanted to inform the people who are doing the work in impacted communities of what we do so that they can involve themselves with the people that are harmed. I can't reach everywhere, but if I can tell Yester Queer the work that I'm doing or Finn's Place the work that I'm doing, they know to then refer them back to me when they see something. And you might not be comfortable coming to see Bonsal Shokumbi in uh, City Hall, but you might be comfortable talking to Jonah Murray about the discrimination that you face, and he can then refer it to me. And so we're doing similar things with other um, populations of reaching out individually to those organizations to help empower them with the knowledge for the individuals that we can't reach because they've already form those relationships. Also with our outreach plan, we try to target the communities that we are called to serve that we know historically have suffered the most um, of police misconduct, things of that nature. So we're working, we're hitting the ground. Um, Taylor has numbers that she has to meet in certain demographics of what we're trying to do to make sure that we're reaching everyone. But partnership is the biggest thing that we can do because those relationships really matter. And I recognize that I'm not gonna be the person that everyone wants to speak to. And I can speak to that outreach. Uh, my office has had, um, I guess, two resource fairs now. The most recent one was at La Gran Plaza. There were hundreds of attendees, you know, and that's predominantly Latino um, at mall. And so uh, I know that some of the tables there touched uh, maybe over 200 people. And so OPOM was there and they were able to just speak to the community on that day as well and in, at our previous uh, resource fair at a rocket ship on the east side. So just uh, creating those opportunities for them to be out in the community as well. Any other questions, comments? No. Okay, well, um, I just wanna say thank you again to everybody who is here today. It's very nice to see some familiar and new faces. Um, thank you to Clayton, Jason, Luis for offering this space. Please know that we still have lots of cookies and water. Please take those home. <laughs> Thank you to PD for being here. Um, so if anybody has any questions for police department that's here, they can also um, communicate with them. Bon Seal, your team is great. Thank you Thank so you. much for accepting this invitation to, for this community discussion. Thank you to my team, Rachel and Maya for being here, this is great. Uh, please stop by my table. We have created push cards um, with need to know um, information uh, for the different departments across the city. And also thank you to Olga for being here. She's our community engagement liaison who works with all the district uh, neighborhood associations in um, District 11. So thank you again for being here. We'll be in this space until 745 for networking and so, um, if you have any questions for me or for Bonsia, we'll be here until then. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.